Hello everyone. Welcome to yet another session of the daily news analysis by Sri Ram's IS, where we take up the important articles featuring in the Hindu newspaper and break them down for our understanding from the examination point of view. So let's start today's discussion by taking up the important articles from the newspaper. The first article, which appears on our screen, reads hard truths about India's labor reforms. Now this is an important editorial which features in the newspaper pertaining to the labor reforms which are undertaken in India. Now what is the status of labor reforms? We know, we often hear in the news that the four labor codes are being promulgated by the government and are yet to be implemented. So this article deals into the veracity of labor reforms at, as to what is the exact state of the reforms right now and what more needs to be done. So in this aspect, let's analyze the status of labor reforms in India. Now what do we mean by labor reforms? First of all, when we say labor reforms or labor laws, whenever labor laws are made, they are made on certain parameters which are the which form the basis of working conditions of the laborers. So they cover many subjects such as what would be the payment of wages to the laborers or uh, uh, laborers and the workers of the many industries that they work into. So there are provisions on the payment of wages. That is why one of the codes is of, on the wage code bill. Then other are safety conditions as to what should be the conditions in the industries. So therefore one of the codes as we saw was the occupational safety uh, code. Then we have the social security aspect in the laborer's uh, job aspect wherein what should be the social security provisions or the benefits that can be given to the laborers and the other workers. So this is also covered and then terms of employment as to what should be the terms of employment, various conditions of employment and dispute resolution as well as to in the wake of any conflict between the employer and the employee what should be the mechanism for resolving the disputes. So these all of these subjects form the part of labor laws and that is why all of these subjects are encompassed into the four labor codes. But the discussion in the author's article is not about the four labor codes but is the current status of implementation of the labor laws. So what is the current status say the dominant theory in use to increase employment the author says is to improve the ease of doing business with the expectation that investments in businesses will improve citizens ease of earning good livelihoods. So the author tries to first set a principle, principle of increasing employment and bettering the employment conditions in the country. And what is that theory? The theory is that we believe that we should encourage the uh, employers to maximize their business, to make their ease of doing business. Uh, sentiment very uh, facilitating their ease of doing business and as and when they are uh, facing ease of doing business the citizens or the workers right to earn better livelihood will automatically will increase. This is the dominant theory that earlier or prevalently it is used that we first focus on the company's ease of doing business and the citizens ease of earning good livelihoods will automatically follow. So in this theory large and formal enterprises create good jobs and labor laws must be flexible to attract investments. So basically this theory gives attention to the companies and making labor laws more favorable attuned to the companies and so, so that they come and invest in the uh, in, in the country and make more and more profits. Then investors say that the laws protect labor too much. So this this is what the investors are always complaining that the labor laws are there, there for the laborers and they protect the worker too much. So, so through this we understood what is the prevalent understanding about the labor laws and increasing the employment in the country. This is what the author challenges in the, in the further article that is, the, is this fact exactly the true fact wherein if we make the job of corporates or the companies and the industries easier, does it really increase or affect the ease of earning good livelihoods for the workers? 
that is what the author tries to analyze and he does so by referring to a report so the vv giri national labor institute's interim report impact assessment study of the labor reforms undertaken by the states this is the report taken out by the national labor institute this provides insights into the impacts of the reforms so far now as we know labor is a concurrent subject which means that whatever laws center makes on it states have to make their own laws and implement in uh, them in their states so this report spanning the period 2004 to 5 to 2018 19 focuses on six states which have implemented these reforms which are rajasthan maharashtra andhra pradesh tamil nadu jharkhand and uttar pradesh so those states which have implemented these labor reforms this report analyzes the status of their reforms and tries to see the development that has taken place so what does it uh, what what are the report's observation first of all the report reminds readers that labor la laws are only one factor affecting business investment decisions this is a, this is very obvious labor forms one of the part for the development of the investment and the companies in the country other factors are there such as having a growing market for its products and other things such as capital machinery materials land and not just labor therefore it must be worthwhile to employ more people before firing them this is first what the uh, report says then the, the then the first conclusion which the report makes and the author makes through the report is that these reforms of labor laws have had little effect in increasing employment in large enterprises which means that these reforms have not had much success in increasing the employment in these enterprises in fact the report says employment in formal enterprises is becoming more informal what does this mean where formal employment means that there is a uh, contract uh, that there's a fixed contract fixed term of employment and all the salaries are fixed where this is the kind of formal uh, formal employment this is decreasing and more informal employment is increasing wherein the large investors can afford to use more capital and are also employing increasing numbers of people on short term contracts while perversely demanding more flexibility in laws so this is what the report is first and uh, and observing which is an important observation to take from the report that what we intended from the uh, labor laws to do that is harmonize the position of workers and laborers in the country it is not having that effect and it is not increasing the employment other than that it is decreasing the formal employment and informal employment is increasing because of the gig economy one can say or the short term contractual labor is increasing wherein the availability of people is high and the companies are employing more and more people on the short term contractual basis so this is the first conclusion that the author makes from the report then <coughs> what about the fact of the this labor reforms benefiting the laborers themselves the workers themselves so this question on the report has left unanswered by the report whether the reforms have benefited the workers this is again a crucial part wherein it is not very clear as to the benefit of these labor reforms has really reached to the laborers and the workers or not so the data to support this the author gives is that between 1980 and 1990 in that decade every for every 1% of gdp <coughs> <coughs> excuse me the author says that for every 1% of the gdp growth in the year 19 from the year 1980 to 1990 the growth in the employment saw roughly 2 lakh new jobs so in the decade from 1980 to 90 we saw growth of 2 lakh new jobs for every 1% of the growth in gdp and that between from 1990 to 2000 the next decade it decreased to 1 lakh jobs per 1% growth so from 2 lakh jobs we came down to 1 lakh jobs in the next decade and in the succeeding decade 2000 to 2010 it fell to half a lakh only which means that as we can see the economy is growing the gdp is growing but the requisite growth in the jobs is not happening so this is useful data which we can uh, take note of 
and make use of in the answers for our mains examination which says that the increase in the economy increase in the gdp has not resulted into requisite increase in the jobs for people so which is a sign of worry and this is what the article highlights that these are the hard truths of labor reforms that they are not really benefiting the, who they should have uh, really benefited to the intended beneficiaries who are the workers or the laborers of these industries so these are the th this is the vital information from this article with this let's move on to our next article for the day the next article now which appears in the newspaper reads bustards adapt to produce two egg clutch now this is an important article fe uh, featuring in the newspaper talking about the great indian bustard right it's a very important uh, animal for, for the country and already upsc has asked a question on this in its prelims examination so with this because of this it becomes important for us to study about this and it becomes important from the perspective of gs3 where we have important aspects of the environment so what does the article say the article says that up until now it was seen since centuries that the great indian bustards used to lay a single egg at a time and for the first time it is seen that many bustards have laid a two egg clutch which means that they have laid two eggs at the same time so that has been a very good development and the article highlights that this development is possible due to the increased monsoon that has happened in the rain deficient areas of jaisalmer and other parts in rajasthan so due to the increase in monsoon and increase in the protein diet of these great indian bustards it has seen that the first time such a development has happened so understanding this fact from the article let's now understand certain important pointers with respect to the great indian bustard so what is the great indian bustard first of all it is the state bird of rajasthan why so because the significant population of great indian bustard is found in the state of rajasthan earlier it the populations were spread across the no parts of north india but now the populations of great indian bustards have dwindled so much that they are only now situated to parts of rajasthan and some parts of gujarat only right and therefore it is considered india's most critically endangered bird it is due to the rapid decrease in the population of great indian bustard it is considered the flagship grassland species representing the health of the grassland ecology what do we mean by flagship species this is a term associated with a lot of animals in the uh, e ecosystem or uh, ecological system what do we mean by flagship species the flagship species are those species the existence of which gives the indication of the health of the total ecosystem those kind of species are known as the flagship eco species so in uh, so these are the so in this way great indian bustard is a flagship species which represent the health of the grassland ecology so its population is confined mostly to rajasthan and gujarat and small populations occur in maharashtra karnataka and andhra pradesh this bird is under constant threats due to collision or electrocution with power transmission lines this has been a major problem for the existence and survival of the great indian bustards where news frequent appears due to the electrocution of them with with the power lines hunting is, is another reason why the population is dwindling which is still prevalent in pakistan habitat loss and alteration as a result of widespread agricultural expansion so all of these reasons form the reason for the dwindling population of the great indian bustard so where is it found it is found in the rajasthan and gujarat region predominantly talking about its protection status at various levels so in the iucn list the iucn list uh, enlists the great indian bustards as a critically endangered animal and in the cites convention or the convention on international trade in endangered species of wild flora and fauna or the what we shortly call as the cites convention it is listed in the appendix 1 again granted the highest protection then under the cms or convention on migratory species there also it is granted the status in appendix 1 and in the wildlife protection act which is the national legislation promulgated to give protection to animals it is also accorded the highest protection under the act that of placing under the schedule 1 which means that 
no provision can be made for hunting of the great Indian bustard. Now, let's talk about what efforts the government has done to protect the great Indian bustard. So, first is the species recovery program. It is kept under the species recovery program under the integrated development of wildlife habitats. So, the integrated development of wildlife habitats is a scheme under the Ministry of uh, Health, Environment and Forest and Climate Change. This is a scheme under which certain animals preserving their territory and habitat is the priority of the scheme and the great Indian bustard is placed under this program. Then there are specialized program for the national bustard uh, recovery as well which is the national bustard recovery plan which is currently being implemented by the conservation agencies. Then we also have the conservation breeding facility. So these bustards which have laid the eggs are under the conservation breeding facility. So the MOEFCC, Rajasthan government and Wildlife Institute of India which is in Dehradun have established a conservating breeding facility in the desert national park which is in Jaisalmer in June 2019. So this is an important place where the great Indian bustards are found which is the desert national park which is there in the districts of Jaisalmer and Barmer. The objective of the program is to build up a captive population of great Indian bustards and to release the chicks in the wild for increasing the population. So this is the development with respect to the conservation efforts which are taken to preserve the population and increase the population thereby of the great Indian bustard. So I hope this information is useful and with this let's move on to our next article for the day. The next article which appears in the newspaper reads, inspect medical facilities given to Kerala endosulfan victims says Supreme Court. Now this is an important case which is going which has been going on for the past few years and the concept of endosulfan becomes important for us from the examination point of view where this can be asked as a mains question and especially as a prelims question as well with respect to what is endosulfan. So what is this case? What is the Supreme Court said in the uh, Kerala endosulfan victims case? Basically endosulfan is a insecticide or a pesticide which is used uh, and in the processes of farming to protect the crops and this pesticide became increasingly harmful and took lives of various residents of Kerala. So that became the case and it went to Supreme Court. So let's understand first what is the Kerala's endosulfan case and then let's we'll take a look at the information which is vital from the examination point of view. So from the mid 70s Kerala villages used aerial spraying of endosulfan on 4600 hectares of cashew nut plantation and locals reportedly experienced illnesses, palsies and deformities due to spraying of these uh, endosulfan pesticides. What happened was that after such around <coughs> excuse me around more than 3000 deaths took place due to spraying of this endosulfan insecticide and then the case went to the Supreme Court and Supreme Court took notice of this uh, incident and granted compensation to the victims. But after granting of the compensation as well, the Kerala authorities did not take any action. So Supreme Court had slammed the Kerala government for state's inaction in providing relief to the endosulfan pesticides exposure victims in spite of having given a judgment for the Kerala government to pay 5 lakh each to the, to the victims. And now what the article is saying that the case is still going on wherein uh, the case in the sense the judgment has come out but the execution of this judgment is still not taking place and the Supreme Court on Thursday directed the Kasargo District Legal Services Authority in Kerala to inspect the medical and palliative care facilities provided to these endosulfan victims. So this has been the case and the current developments up until now. Now let's understand a few things about this endosulfan pesticide. What is it? It is a widely banned pesticide with hazardous effect on human genetic and endocrine systems. It has various hazardous effect. It was found first it was sprayed but then it was found that it has various hazardous effects such as it, has, it uh, results into delayed reproductive development, it can result into sensory loss, neurotoxicity. How is it neurotoxic? 
endosulfan blocks the inhibitory receptors of the central nervous system disrupts the ionic channels and destroys the integrity of the nerve cells which is the rep report of fact finding mission so it was found that it was highly neurotoxic which means that it in it it uh, directly impacts the brain of the victims or whoever is in contact with this endosulfan then it also results into endocrine disruption and bioaccumulation which means that this substance accumulates in the body and does not leave the body then also results into autism these are all the negative impacts which was found out that the endosulfan has on the human body and other aspects which is why it was banned by the stockholm convention which is the premium convention which deals on the persistent organic pollutants so this is an important convention the stockholm convention was found uh, enlists 12 such chemicals or pollutants which are known as pops or persistent organic pollutants so out of these 12 endosulfan is one of them which is why in may 13 2011 the supreme court of india issued temporary ban on production storage and sale of endosulfan so these are the important information with respect to endosulfan right we saw it is widely banned pesticide with hazardous effect and it does not occur naturally in the environment and it is listed as we saw banned under the stockholm convention on persistent organic pollutants and it is also listed under the rotterdam convention on the prior informed consent this is also a convention dealing with the harmful chemicals and the regulation of these harmful chemicals in various countries and the supreme court therefore banned endosulfan about the effects we saw on the various effects but first of all its uses where is endosulfan used it is sprayed on crops like cotton cashew fruits tea paddy tobacco and for control of pests in agriculture such as white flies aphids beetles worms and other things these effects that endosulfan has we took a look at and we saw how harmful it can be for the sprayers that is why the ban so this chemical becomes important and it can always be asked in the examination and the various aspects related to it so with this we finish the important articles from today's newspaper and we'll meet again tomorrow from the important articles from the tomorrow's newspaper thank you